Are you all fit? No. <laughs> Welcome. We are doing family Bible time again. Deuteronomy chapter 17, 18, 19 and 20. Four chapters. So let's pray and let's go. Lord in heaven, we thank you for food from your word. Lord, it is food for our souls and we praise you for what it does in our lives. Please teach us, continue to change us, educate us, correct us, equip us, prepare us, protect us, strengthen us, we pray by your word. We beg you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep which has which is in which is a blemish, any defect whatever, for that is an abomination to the Lord your God. Yes. <laughs> First question. <laughs> Speak up. And why is under what blemish means? Blemish? Why didn't I explain it? Why didn't you ask before? Blemish. Well, I have plenty of blemishes. Um, and they're just little spots or something wrong with it. Plenty wrong with me. And the, the, so if it's, if it's spotless, it's got no blemishes. If it's maybe got a, a you know, if, a, if, an, if it had a half an ear or something like that, that would be a blemish, wouldn't it? Anyway. Verse 2. If there is found among you within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, a man or a woman who does what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God in transgressing his covenant and has gone and served other gods and worshipped them, or the sun, or the moon, or any of the host of heaven which I have forbidden, and it is told you, and you hear of it, then you shall immediately believe everything you hear and have the person executed. Is that what it says? No. Careful, I'm, I'm, I'm just... That wasn't what it right was written in the Bible. Then you shall, what does it say? Inquire diligently, and if it is true and certain, that means if it's not certain, if the report is not certain, you, you mustn't act like this, but if it, if it is true and certain that such an abomination has been done in Israel, verse 5, then you shall bring out to your gates that man or woman who has done this evil thing and you shall stone that man or woman to death with stones on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses the one who is to die shall be put to death a person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness the hand of the witness shall be first against him to put him to death and afterward the hand of all the people, so you shall purge the evil from your midst. If any case arises requiring decision between one kind of homicide and another, one kind of legal right and another, or one kind of assault and another, in cases within any case within your towns that is too difficult for you, then you shall arise and go up to the place that the Lord your God will choose, and you shall come to the Levitical priests and to the judge who is in office in those days, and you shall consult them, and they shall declare to you the decision. So they had kind of like courts, and then this is like a high court. So you, if something was something had to be proved to be certain, true and certain. That means they would end up with a, something like a court system with a prosecution and a defence. And now this is like a high court. If, it's, if it can't be decided, it has to go up to the, the judge and it has to be decided there. Then 
verse 10, then you shall do according to all what they, according to what they declare to you from the place that the Lord will choose. And you shall be careful to do according to all that they direct you, according to the instructions that they give you and according to the decision that they pronounce to you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside from the verdict that they declare to you, either to the right hand or to the left. The man who acts presumptuously by not obeying the priest who stands to minister there before the Lord your God or the judge, that man shall die. So you are to purge the evil from Israel, and the people shall hear and fear and not act presumptuously again. <sighs> Verse 14, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it, and then, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Hang on a minute, what did Solomon do? Oh dear. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him and he shall read it, he shall read in it all the days of his life. In other words, just like us, the king of Israel was supposed to read the Bible every day. And he was supposed to even copy it out for himself, his very own copy of the Bible that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left so that he may continue long in his kingdom he and his children in israel oh, what a different world it would have been if solomon and david had really kept to that. Do you think David would have committed adultery with Bathsheba if he'd have been reading in the Bible and meditating on it every day? Do you think Solomon would have accumulated lots of wives and so much gold and silver and horses? He actually did do the horses as well. Anyway, there we are. Let it be a warning to us. Verse 18, the Levitical priest, uh, chapter 18, sorry. The Levitical priests, all the tribe of Levi, shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's food offerings as their inheritance. They shall have no inheritance among their brothers. The Lord is their inheritance as he promised them. And this shall be the priest's due from the people from those offering a sacrifice, whether an ox or a sheep, they shall give to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach. The first fruits of your grain, of your wine and of your oil, and the first fleece of your sheep, you shall give him. For the Lord your God has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand and minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons for all time. And if a Levite comes from any of your towns out of all Israel where he lives, and he may come when he desires, 
to the place that the Lord will choose, and ministers in the name of the Lord his God, like all his fellow Levites who stand to minister there before the Lord, then he may have equal portions to eat, besides what he receives from the sale of his patrimony. Hmm. Verse 9. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a wizard or a necromancer. Is that clear enough? For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. Now, just a little word. When you watch the movies and um, read the books that are, you know, fiction, and they play with this idea of witches and and wizards and um, fortune tellers, and they make it kind of fun... Um, uh, and and we we in our family we love to we love to watch Tolkien, don't we? Or to to listen to the the Lord of the Rings um, and and that kind of thing. And and it's fantasy, and we we say we enjoy it. But look, that's fantasy. This is reality, and in reality, those things are an abomination to God. To be a wizard, we think it's cool that Gandalf can do, can do magic, and and do tricks, and in fantasy world you think, okay, that's all right. But listen, in reality, there are lots of boys and girls who, who have kind of crossed over the line between fantasy, and reality, and. There's, a, there's more and more movies being made which try to make witches and wizards and fortune tellers and um, necromancers, people who get in mediums, people who get in touch with the spirits of the dead, or they think they do at least, are getting in touch with evil spirits. They try to make those things kind of real and, and yet attractive and, and scary, but scary but interesting and that is leading people in our country today growing boys and girls it's leading them to be interested and to really want to actually do these things for real now how does god feel about that this is how god feels about it is it safe no it is not safe I'm going to say there are real evil spirits and they are demons and there are no good spirits getting in touch with people and there are real evil powers. They come from demons and anyone who dabbles in that world is putting, is, they're, they're, they're getting into an area that is so dangerous and so wicked I've got to give a warning, a warning to everyone listen, listening to this, that God hates it and God is against it. And if you go down that road, you are walking away from God. So don't do it. Don't even go near it. Don't even play with it. If you watch something that's fantasy, and if you can separate fantasy from reality, all right, but if you see your heart getting drawn after it in any way, or if you see a movie or a, some read a book or something where it's 
making it a bit more real and a bit, little bit attractive, run away from it because God hates it. Am I clear? <laughs> Am I clear? Is God clear? That's the question, isn't it? Is God clear? God is clear, and we should be very clear and very careful. All right, verse 15. This is fantastic. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. This is a prophecy given to Moses about a prophet like Moses. From among you, from, among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Oh, who's this prophet like Moses? Verse 16. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to to them all that I command him, and whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Who's that speaking about? It's actually a prophecy about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the prophet like Moses. And he came, and if we don't listen to Jesus, God will require it of him. Is that what you were going to say? <laughs> Verse 20. But the prophet, oh, this is a warning because there are plenty of so-called prophets who presume to speak a word in God's name. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. That's how God feels about presuming to speak for him. You, we should be careful before we ever say, God has said to me, don't say those words unless you're going to quote the Bible. Verse 21, and if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word that, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. And according to this, you need he in the Old Testament Israel, uh, he would have to die. That's a real warning, isn't it, to modern day so-called prophets? There are no prophets existing today where everything they predict comes true. That just doesn't exist. You can't find them. They don't even claim that. They modern day prophets who say oh i'm a prophet i'm speaking for god uh, in the church there there are people like that but they all say well we get it wrong sometimes in fact we get it wrong most of the time one of the most famous prophets so called prophets said well we get it wrong about 80% of the time maybe 20% of the time maybe Maybe one in five prophecies we get wrong and that we get right. And that's really, really, that's a really, really good prophet, he would say. Would you know what God would say about that? God would say he's presuming to speak in my name. Because if he, if he says it and it doesn't come true, then he's spoken presumptuously. And if he's spoken presumptuously, if he presumes to speak a word, in the name of the Lord, according to this, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20, he had to die. That's how God feels about it. So don't listen to so-called prophets. All right, verse chapter 19. When the Lord your God cuts off the nations whose land the Lord your God is giving you, and you dispossess them and dwell in their cities and in their houses, you shall set apart three cities for yourselves in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. 
you shall measure the distances and divide into three parts the area of the land that the Lord your God gives you as a possession so that any manslayer can flee to them. This is the provision for the manslayer who by fleeing there may save his life. If anyone kills his neighbor unintentionally without having hated him in the past, as when someone goes into the forest with his neighbor to cut wood and his axe swings and, and his hand swings the axe to cut down a tree and, and the head of the and the head slips from the handle and strikes his neighbor so that he dies. He may flee to one of these cities and live, lest the avenger of blood in hot anger pursue the manslayer and overtake him, and because the way is long and strike him fatally though the man did not deserve to die since he had not hated his neighbor in the past. Therefore I command you, you shall set apart three cities, and if the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he has sworn to your fathers and gives you all the land that he promised to give to your fathers, provided you are careful to keep all this commandment which I command you today by loving the Lord your God and by walking ever in his ways, then you shall add three other cities to these three, lest innocent blood be shed in your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, and so the guilt of bloodshed be upon you. But if anyone hates his neighbor and lies in wait for him, and attacks him and strikes him fatally so that he dies, and he flees to one of these cities, then... The elders of his city shall send and take him from there and hand him over to the avenger of blood so that he may die. Your eye shall not pity him, but you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from Israel so that it may be well with you. Verse 14. You shall not move your neighbor's landmark, which the men of old have set in the inheritance that you will hold in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Verse 15. A single witness shall not suffice against any person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offence that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently. And if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity, it shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So that was really good, wasn't it? Because that the, the punishments in Israel were really severe, weren't they? I mean, let's say you let's imagine you had a dispute with your neighbor and you wanted to get rid of him and you had terrible I mean people can be really cruel, can't they? And they can just lie and make things up. And let's imagine that you you thought, I'm going to get rid of my horrible neighbor that I don't like. And I'm going to tell the judges that I saw him in his back garden, bowing down and worshipping the sun. Mm. And he's going to be killed because the law says if he's, if he's a sun worshipper, he must die. Oh, but if the judges did their job properly, they would inquire diligently, wouldn't they? Diligently. That means really carefully. And they would see 
and they would make sure, verse 4 of chapter 17, they would inquire diligently, and if it is true and certain, well, they would make sure it was true and certain, but in that process of making sure whether it was true and certain, if it came out that the person making the accusation was actually lying and making a false accusation, hold on a minute, then the punishment that would have been done to the neighbour would be done to him. So then he would have to be killed. That's what you call proper justice. Anyway, chapter 20. This is all different, isn't it? There's a whole lot of different laws here. And it's fascinating to get a bit of insight into what life would have been like under God's law in Israel. Chapter 20, verse 1. When you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when you draw near to battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people and say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Then the officers shall speak to the people, saying, Is there any man who's built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. And is there any man who's planted a vineyard and has not enjoyed its fruit? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man enjoy its fruit. And is there any man who has betrothed a wife and has not taken her. Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. And the officers shall speak further to the people and say, Is there any man who's fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go back to his house, lest he make the heart of his fellows melt like his own. And when the officers have finished speaking to the people, then commanders shall be appointed at the head of the people, When you draw near to a city to fight against it, offer terms of peace to it. And if it responds to you peaceably and opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labour for you and shall serve you. Well, that's a lot better than dying, isn't it? Verse 12. But if it makes no peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall put all its males to the sword. For the women and the little ones, the livestock and everything else in the city, all its spoil you shall take as plunder for yourselves. And you shall enjoy the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given you. Thus you shall do to all the cities that are very far from you, which are not cities of the nations here. But... In the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes, but shall devote them to complete destruction. The Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the, Itch, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded, that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices that they have done to their, for their gods. And so you sin against the Lord your God. When you besiege a city for a long time, making war against it in order to take it, you shall not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against them. You may eat from them, but you shall not cut them down. Are the trees in the field human, that they should be besieged by you? Only the trees that are not, only the trees that you know are not trees for food, you may destroy and cut down 
that you may build, build siege works against the city that makes war with you until it falls. So those were the rules for the people of Israel when they went to war against other countries. So when people made war against them and they had to go and fight against a neighboring country and they had to besiege the city, those were the rules. So now you know if you're ever in a war besieging a city that's made war against Israel, you know what to do. It's funny, isn't it? We're learning these things, but these are things that were for them. But we're learning principles, aren't we? Principles. Does, does God think justice is important? That's interesting, isn't it? You think, you think oh, this is all about wars and about history. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. How many squabbles and fights in a family would be solved between brothers and sisters would how many of those squabbles and fights would be solved if you all truly feared the lord and remembered that god loves true justice and if you accuse your neighbor if you accuse your brother your sister of something it really had better be true and if it's not, remember, God sees and God knows. And, and God cares about truth and justice. God is not a God who is okay with us just making things up. Or is okay with punishment where there should be no punishment. Or God is not okay where, with no punishment when there should be punishment. God is not okay with us speaking for him when he didn't tell us to speak for him. <laughs> we should be very careful, shouldn't we? These are things that we need to learn for our homes, for our country, even though we're not Israel. and We don't have all these laws in the same way that Israel had them. But we need to learn the principles. And we, we could wish that our own country had better principles of justice. But, you know, we actually do have some principles of justice that we can praise God for. I've, I've been privileged to go into a court and watch a judge inquire diligently and carefully and make a very careful decision based on all the evidence. And, and, you know, that is a real privilege. Pray for our country that that kind of carefulness in our judicial system is preserved because when it's not, it's terrible. And when it is, it's a blessing. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of justice. Thank you for the blessing of judges that inquire carefully and diligently. Please preserve such privileges in our country, we pray. And we pray, Father, in our homes that we might love truth and justice. And we pray that we would hate what you hate and not become enchanted with uh, things which you say are an abomination. Lord, deliver us from evil. Lead us in paths of righteousness, we pray. And thank you. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. God bless you. We're done for today. Until tomorrow. This was family Bible time. <laughs>